will do now. <coughs> we will see where's the one I want. Just look at the rise. Um, this is the cover of Dryzik's book called Green States and Social Movements. Green uh, environmentalism in the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, and Norway. You may ask why? Why are they discussing these four states? It's not because those four states are important. It's because these four states represent four different types of interactions between state elites and environmental movements. And Dreisen has some discussion about the interaction of green states and so forth. His main claim that there's four ideal types of state response and interaction with their domestic green social movements, that no state exclusively and statically is a pure case of a certain style of response. They say, however, some states exhibit one style typically, and they choose among only four types of interactions so far. These four types of state movement interactions are an analytic tool. Some states serve better than others to analyze the outcomes of such styles. That's why they chose those four states. Four types help, one, define the variations of state politics and green politics around the world. It's not the same environmental movement around the world. It's very, very different culturally and politically. And also, they say, if you define the variations, you can explain diverse outcomes of how successful or how much of a failure these movements are. And if you have an argument about success or failure, obviously they have suggestions for what would be the best kind of social movement and the best kind of state response. Um, anyway, their main claim, after looking at comparative historical research, that there are general core imperatives of all states. Um, and from number two, it's uh, successful green social movements, they don't challenge the state. They actually argue that the state can be made better. So green movements that have been very successful have associated themselves with any or all of the five core imperatives. Now you ask, what are these core imperatives? Um, I'll get to that in a minute, but the next one they say there's another core imperative that may be environmental protection. The state may increasingly require environmental protection as one of its goals. The five core imperatives now, and the one in the future may be ecological protections. Historically, number one core imperative is keeping order. Green movements that have been successful have argued and acted to maintain order. They haven't intentionally destroyed civic order. Compete internationally. Green movements that have been successful have found ways of helping states compete internationally. Um, raise resources to finance the first two tasks. Green movements that have been successful, they argue. <coughs> Green movements that have been successful, they argue, encourage raising resources for state competitiveness. Um, and the claim of more modern Eurocentric ideas like the economic imperative, security, economic growth for capitalists and labor. So green movements that can argue economic growth is useful, these have been more successful than those that have opposed economic growth. And the fifth imperative, they say, came out of the human cost of capitalism and the sponsorship of it by the states. And it's a legitimization, a legitimating imperative. This is the social movements that created the welfare state. The state created a welfare state, they argue, to stop civil revolution against the capitalist system. And so uh, if green environmental movements somehow link to the welfare state, this uh, would encourage their durability. The sixth form imperative, they say, is there one starting. Recent historical uh, origins of the last two, um, number four and number five, were associated with social movements. So they say, why not number six? Number six, which is ecological imperatives, it's 
also associated with the social movement. So, if you look back here, this one was associated with the social movement. The social movement of the capitalists uh, moving into state aristocratic power, and um, it was a social movement associated with this new imperative. And this was a social movement associated with this new imperative of the welfare state. <coughs> and so they argue the other social movement, the green social movement, may create a new social imperative of ecological protection, that the state may be required uh, to conduct this. It says, though the green state does not yet exist, they want to document, theorize, and provide recommendations about how to handle the various trajectories, the various paths that the green social movements have experienced over the past 30 years <coughs> in different state movement interactions. The four states they analyze. States are split, they say, on active or passive response. Some states, when they see an environmental movement, they call them. You come and talk to us in the legislature. We would like to invite you into the executive to discuss the ramifications of this in development plan. That's a very active response. A passive response is there's an environmental movement, but the state does not respond and refuses to integrate. So that's one way of analyzing elite behavior. Um, inclusive or exclusive response. An inclusive response is pulling people into the state. Um, you ask them to come. An exclusive response, an active exclusive, where you see an environmental movement and you repress it. That's an active response. So there's four different ways where you can see the interaction of states in this matter. Let me open up something. <clears throat> this is from the book. And it's how they analyze the four different cases. An active and inclusive state is Norway. Norway actually doesn't need a strong environmental movement. In fact, every social movement in Norway is quickly pulled into the state. And there is no or very limited civil society in oppositional sense. Norway's culture, as well as its state elites, don't encourage opposition within civil society. What about an active exclusive? This was in the United Kingdom. When the environmental movement began in Britain, it was heavily repressed. Lots of violent reactions. The state didn't accept its existence. It was very repressive. What about passive? Um, I remember that Dreisig says, these are ideal types. These don't exist in a pure form. I would actually put the U.S. closer into uh, the exclusive and active uh, because of books uh, written about uh, this. A good book is called um, The War on the Greens. Uh, there's a book detailing state terrorism, really, upon the American green movements uh, from, from states as well as from private entities. Anyway, but they want to say that sometimes the USA is inclusive, that if a large enough group of people support it, the elites see this as important for gaining votes. But there's a plurality of different groups in society. Um, what about passive and exclusive? Uh, Germany, they say, is a good example of this under corporatism. Corporatism means you have a discussion from the state, major corporations and producers, and the labor movement. And unions. And those three groups are known as corporatism. And corporatism in Germany did not have room for another social movement. And Germany repressed this as well as sort of passively ignored it at the same time. They were not interested in including this at all. It says the passively inclusive state accepts and accommodates whatever constellation of interests, groups, and movements that social forces generate. Acceptance can take the form of lobbyists on behalf of interest groups, walking the corridors of the legislature, a social movement forming a political party to contest elections, representation of the movement's activists in the state.
infrastructure of the party. And that includes very inclusive. An actively inclusive state is not just content to wait, uh, but it actually pulls, anticipate, and organizes the interest into the state. Proposals for such an actively inclusive state may be found among the political theorists who believe <coughs> the existing pattern of politics uh, uh, in developed societies features less activity and influence than it ought to on the part of the right kind of associations. Uh, so, Norway is an example of the inclusive. Also, passively exclusive states, they say, like uh, corporatist countries, they are not interested in bringing in additional civil societies into power. Actively inclusive state, this is re the repressive version, is one that tries to undermine the conditions under which oppositional movements are likely to form. The best contemporary examples of such states in relatively developed societies can be found among those under the sway of market liberal ideology, neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is a very actively exclusive uh, form of state policy against environmentalism. And that is uh, what they say. Our fourfold classification of states as they present themselves to social movements is necessarily a bit of a simplification. In the real world, some states combine features of two or more of these categories. And over time, they may shift the position. England shifted shift the categories. They were very actively exclusive, but then slightly integrated over time. It says, nevertheless, the four categories have utility as relatively enduring ideal types. In undertaking comparative empirical analysis, it has been most instructive to look for the closest approximation to each type. And that's why they choose these four countries. And the book is a summary of the history of the interaction of states and environmental movements. And you see very different outcomes. If you think that your country is the way all environmental movements work, it's not true, they said. There's quite a large amount of variety. And the variety provides examples of where the most successful strategies are, they said. And that's all I want to say about this topic. Let's move back to our PowerPoint.